Welcome everyone. So whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching it um, later in the week, it's great to have you join us today. This is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week, that week that leads up to Easter, uh, when we celebrate Jesus' death on a cross. Yes, celebrate that because three days later, he was resurrected. So we're going to focus on how we can kind of come alive to God's story. A story that has the power to transform. Transform our lives and our world by the grace of God. And we'll see Jesus' life, sacrifice and his power. His life which was above and beyond human understanding. Certainly for those around at the time. They didn't get it. So Palm Sunday is often referred to as Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But he arrived on a donkey. That was his mode of transport. Now, I don't know about you, but if it was me and it was supposed to be a triumphal entry, I'd want at least in those days a big white stallion. Impressive. But no, Jesus he came on a donkey. And you know, the thing is, it wasn't a last minute thing. The entry into Jerusalem wasn't a spur of the moment where he had to scratch around, you know, looking for something to ride into town on. No, no. Every detail was pre-planned long before Jesus arrived that day. Long before this momentous week in history. You see, it was part of God's bigger plan. And some 400 years earlier, the prophet Zechariah said this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation. Gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt. The fall of a donkey. Earlier, Peter read uh, from Matthew chapter 21. And Matthew quotes that passage from Zechariah uh, in, in that section. You see, Jesus specifically wanted a donkey to fulfill that prophecy. The donkey represented Jesus' humility. But it was also there because it sent a message to the Jews who were around for the Passover feast. They would know that Old Testament prophecy. That he was the coming king. Not a warrior king. But a true king. Who would reign forever. And God's story of love, forgiveness, grace and redemption. The Messiah that they'd been waiting for. This was the message. The Messiah that you've been waiting for. He has arrived riding on a donkey. Now in the passage that Peter read from Matthew, it talks about the palms, palm branches. And these were kind of, um, at the time, they were a, a sign of, of victory. Uh, you know, I was, when I was reading this, I was um, thinking about many years ago when the kids were little. Vanessa was just a toddler. And uh, Margaret, in her wisdom, had decided that we should um, take up this offer this great deal to spend a week at uh, Pontins in Morecambe. Now that was not a kind of holiday that kind of appealed to me but I thought well why not it's a good deal we'll go down so we drive down the car got the three kids in the back doing the usual saying you know are we there dad every 10 minutes but when we were nearly there and we saw the building it was like a prison camp so we went to reception and we checked in and uh, we were shown to the room, the chalet that we were going to have for the week, it was scruffy. There was no telly in, uh, didn't look like it had been hoovered, opened a cupboard, and one of the previous occupants, dirty underwear was in the bottom of it. Not something to ponder on too long. And we just looked at each other and said, we're not stopping here. So we went back to the reception, we got our money back and we left. It was a bank holiday weekend and we had to find somewhere to stay and we found this, eventually it, everywhere was full a um, bit like when Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem when Jesus was being born. Everywhere was full 
but we eventually found a bed and breakfast that had a room with a double bed and two bunk beds. That'll do. It was a dreadful night. Vanessa was over height, uh, bouncing on the bed till like three o'clock in the morning. Um, none of us got any real sleep. And uh, so it wasn't what we expected. It wasn't what we were looking for. And that was kind of the way it was for uh, the Jews and a lot of the people when Jesus came riding in on his donkey. They were waving their palm branches, that traditional sign of victory, as I said. And for the crowd, they could almost taste that sweet victory. Their rescuer, their Messiah, had finally arrived. And he would lead them in the overthrow of their oppressors, being the Romans. He would stamp on those Romans and set up his new perfect kingdom. Well, you see, that wasn't the plan. And the crowd who were waving palm branches in um, sort of preparation for this victory they were going to witness didn't get what they expected. And many in that crowd who approved of him then on his arrival, including the Pharisees and the other religious leaders, well, they saw him as a threat and things were going to change. None of them understood the magnitude of what Jesus was preparing to do. In John 12 and verse 16, it says, At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. See, it was only later, so they're not quite getting what was going on. And the question for us today is, do we really grasp it? What do you expect from Jesus this Easter? Anything? Nothing? For many in the world, they don't expect anything of Jesus at Easter. They might expect a normal times holiday. They might expect um, Easter eggs, chocolate ones, and all the things that kind of tradition is now associated with Easter. But this was all about Jesus and for us it's an opportunity to once again experience his power and his victory in our lives. Now did anyone follow the US presidential elections? Maybe not the most recent one involving um, Donald Trump and Joe Biden but all uh, the sort of American presidential elections. They seem to go on forever. And the candidates troll around the country, holding rallies to drum up support and get the people to like them and vote for them so they can get elected. But that wasn't Jesus' goal when he entered Jerusalem. He knew what was coming. He knew that he would die on a cross. And the same crowd that were shouting, Hosanna! when he came in, this victory cry would soon turn and would be shouting instead, crucify him, crucify him. None of this changed Jesus' purpose or his actions. You see, his actions, his purpose did not depend on human praise or approval. And that's what the world offers. So many of uh, our young people and even older ones crave celebrity, crave attention and crave the praise of others. So many of our leaders are like that. Popularity politics, they will do what seems popular at the time rather than the right thing based on principles, based on character, based on truth and these days it's anything but the truth of God's word this was not Jesus he didn't crave the approval of man Jesus knew his next destination was going to be the grave Jesus was demonstrating 
the importance of the day to all creation, which under the curse of sin was in need of redemption. Jesus' purpose was to offer himself as the ultimate perfect sacrifice so that everyone, all of us, all of you watching this, anyone hearing this message, and all creation could see and worship God in spirit and in truth. And you see, we have the benefit of hindsight, which the disciples did not. It would take a little while for them to kind of grasp and understand what had happened. So as we approach Easter and look at Jesus' actions, then we can come alive to his life. Jesus was dedicated to his task, his purpose, his destiny, not for selfish reasons, but for his love of creation and all of humanity. The words of Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, say this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We cannot think as God thinks, but we can learn from the life and the actions and the words of Jesus. Those words from Isaiah are as appropriate now as they were when they were written hundreds of years before the events of that first Easter week. See, Jesus came in humility. He lived among us in solidarity. And he sacrificed everything in obedience. John 3.16, probably the most famous verse in the Bible, tells us everything. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him, will not perish but will have eternal life jesus brought god's love and life to us he was the bridge to facilitate our path back to relationship with him and god the father watch this video and now i'll come back i remember when I was 17 and a woman asked me, are you saved? I didn't have any idea what she meant. I was like, saved, what the heck is saved? Well, the best thing I could think through was maybe she means, am I like my grandmother? And um, I adamantly told her no, because <laughs> I'm not like my grandmother. I do hip hop music. It's more than music, it's actually a culture. It's the lens by which you see the world. They talking reckless, what you expecting from the walking dead. Man, it's okay to be bold, passionate. It's masculinity, that's what I do. <laughs> I used to sneak and watch rap videos in my grandmother's house, because I was too little. She wouldn't have let me watch them. And I would sit there and watch them, and I would just marvel. Late at night, I found people to look up to. There were no, uh, Barack Obama's, there were no Martin Luther King's and Malcolm X's, they'd all passed away, and so I had Tupac. I've been trapped since birth, cautious cause I'm cursed. The fantasies of my family in a hearse. And they say it's the white man I should fear, but it's my own kind doing all the killing here. I wasn't a, the greatest athlete, definitely wasn't a scholarly student. I wasn't the toughest guy, um, but being able to rap was my source of significance. I grew up wrestling with significance because my, my father and my mother weren't together. Um, never met my father. He uh, became a drug addict and kind of let his life crumble. I felt like my dad was this piece of my life that I needed to have to feel like I was somebody. Having a single mother who worked a lot, you know, she just had to entrust me in the care of family members and different people a lot of times. I experienced abuse as a kid. I experienced neglect and, and uh, you know, different kind of things. And so I was just one real significance and I didn't feel like I was gonna get it trying to be uh, this manicured, good, all around student. 
in person. The people I looked up to were gangsters. You know, my uncle, I remember him, you know, showing me a gun and I just wanted to be like those guys. So I took a, a BB gun and stood in the middle of the street and pointed it at a car and, um, and just saw the lady panic and freak out. And for me, that was just fun. I, I just I didn't have anything to do. I wanted to be back in the inner city. I wanted to be, you know, doing criminal activity. So I just kept rebelling and I, I kept doing worse in drugs, 16, fighting all the time. Got arrested in high school for stealing. He was just like, man, what are you, what are you gonna do with your life? Got put on a gang list. I remember thinking like, man, I guess I, I, I'm supposed to care. Went from drugs to drinking to I'm a wreck. Partying to I don't fit anywhere. I'm just this misfit of a person. My mother was like, you just need to read your Bible. And I remember ripping the pages out of the Bible and throwing it on the floor. I said, I don't want this Bible. I just couldn't wrap my hands around this being true, this being real. My grandmother was a Christian. You know, I would have to go to church with her. It was, it was like older people, it was old people. So for me, church wasn't about God, and church was for them. It wasn't for me. It's probably not real. Probably just something people use as a crutch. I think as the emptiness started to, to get more profound, when I had to drink more, smoke more, find another woman, another woman, another woman, I was really, really, really in a dark place. 5.46 in the morning. Tossing and turning, chest burning. Sermons in my head keep reoccurring. Having visions in my head of a kid crying at the feet of the father for all the wrong things that he did. Now I'm sweating in my sheets, can't sleep cause my mind keep telling me I'm six feet deep. Don't remind me, even though I'm still alive, I can't tell. The way I'm living my life, I feel I'm going to hell. Um, I got invited by a friend to a conference. And, uh, you know, I'm really just more excited about being in a big city. I'm more excited about there being girls. I'm more excited about just what the city brings. I'm not really concerned about the conference. So I get to the conference and um, I see like, I see guys who have been shot from being in gangs. I see, you know, girls who were extremely promiscuous in the past. I see rappers, I see dancers, I see singers, I see people who came from the same background I came from, um, and they still embodied who they were culturally, but they were all in love with Jesus, and I'd never seen that before. And then I saw another group, and they, they were sold out for Jesus, and they were rapping, and, they, and you heard about it in their songs, and I was just like, what in the world? And as I listened to the lyrics, I was like, man, I don't know this. I don't understand this God, this God they're talking about. And then finally, uh, someone got up and said, do you know you've been bought with a price? And he told me the story of Jesus on Golgotha and, and him carrying the cross and him uh, bearing all of my sin, all of my lying, all of my cheating, all of my my, my escapades, all of my drinking and drugging and put it on his own back. And he said, I was bought with the price. And it made me think, man, I'm, like, somebody thinks I'm significant enough to die for me. Somebody thinks I'm significant enough to climb up this mountain with this cross on his back and take nails in his wrists and his feet for me. I remember articulating like, God, get me out of this, just don't kill me. Do whatever you gotta do to get me out of this, just don't kill me. I was driving down the highway and I turned too quick and lost control of the wheel. My car flipped over again and again. The roof caved in, windshield caved in, no seat belt, glass everywhere. My glasses that I had on were molded like kind of into the frame of the car and uh, and I didn't have a scratch. That was it. <laughs> I said, I get it. Called up my friends who I knew were living for Jesus and I said, we gotta make this happen. 
Um, I'm coming home. I saw change happening. I spent a lot of time searching for father figures. I saw the evidence. And God has shown me that, you know, ultimately he's my father. And it drives me to keep pressing. I started volunteering at a juvenile detention center. And some of those songs that I had written in my darkest of times when I was crying out to God, I would do for him. And you just see him sitting there weeping. And time after time, they keep requesting it. Can you do that song again? Can you do that song again? I just need that to hold on to. I need something that's going to remind me that I need Jesus. It hit me like, this is what I want to do. I want to use music to, to offer hope and encouragement to people. I was created by God, but I didn't want to be like him. I want to be him, the Jack Sparrow of my Caribbean. I remember the first created being and how he shifted the blame on his dame from fruit he shouldn't have eaten. And now look at us all out of eating, wearing designer fig leaves by Louis Vuitton, make believing. But God sees through my foolish pride and that I'm weak like Adam, another victim of Lucifer's lies. But then in steps Jesus. All men were created to lead, but we needed somebody to lead us more than a teacher, but somebody to buy us back from the darkness. You could say he redeemed us. I've learned to stay close to my source of significance, to my source of worth, and uh, that's God. My name is Lecrae, and I am second. You see, Lecrae is a rapper, and he started off using his um, talent, his ability in that area, for all the wrong reasons and with the wrong purpose in mind. But when he met Jesus, everything turned around and God used and is using his talent and his heart's desire for his purposes. Just as his life was changed and his talents and abilities were used not for wrong, but for good purposes, for God's purposes, it's the same for you and me. Today, we can come alive to Jesus' life. And as we um, go through this week and next two sessions on this, we, we head on to Jesus' sacrifice uh, and his death on Good Friday. And then we celebrate his resurrection on Easter Sunday. But today we have another opportunity, if you like, to invite Jesus to enter into our hearts and our lives. He is Messiah. He is King. Let's open our eyes and our hearts full of gratitude and join him in humility and obedience and live our lives focused on the work of restoration, of healing, and true life in a world that has lost its way. God's heart must break when he sees what sin is doing in the lives of individuals and communities and nations. But he challenges us. The change starts with us. The change starts with me and with you. Let's spend a little bit of time in this week up to Easter thinking about everything that Jesus did, thinking about the plan that he revealed to us. Think about the type of King and Lord that he is and let's worship him. Father God, we I want to thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you've revealed to us. Help us, Lord, to turn from our selfish ways and in humility and obedience follow you and walk in your ways, that we might be effective as individuals 
and corporately in our fellowships to change the world, to change it in a way that is pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord. Amen.